individuals that have been uh, part of the church. This gentleman that I'm going to ask right now, Todd Erickson, if you'd make your way up, um, has been blessing our hearts. He's not a member of the church, but he's blessed our hearts. Uh, by the way, I've just enjoyed the music today. That beard, um, Don, what a blessing that you sound a little bit more like Kenny Rogers as you sing today. I just, just, you got to know when to hold him, Don. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. But um, just thank the Lord for Todd. Uh, Over 10 years ago, you shared testimony on an Easter Sunday here. You had just um, lost a child through a tragedy. And uh, you shared and and just it was a tough, tough uh, story to hear and what God's done in your life uh, through that. But the amazing thing about our walk with Christ that I've found over the years is you don't just have one story. He keeps no, no. peeling away this onion. And so the other day we had opportunity to have breakfast together and he started to share some things that the Lord's been teaching him recently. And I thought, boy, it'd be great if our church family could hear a little bit about that because testimony of what God's doing is, is a powerful thing. And so um, could you take us to um, what what God started to do in your heart in the area of, or being made aware of where your heart was and then what he started to do and what he used to do that and things along that line. I think you know where I'm, what yeah. I mean. Yeah. Um, really, you know, when we have this relationship with the Lord, we, we oftentimes think of what, what can we do for God and we can strive and we can get caught up in getting busy and um, everybody's in full-time ministry. You have to come to grips with that, right? Some of us get paid for it. Um, and for me, I uh, serve in the ministry, Child Evangelism Fellowship, I was just really striving a lot and pushing and pushing, and um, I uh, just really found myself as a, as a young person serving in the ministry when I was here sharing. I was just going into directing uh, a local director up in North Dakota, and then pushing and pushing, seeing more fruit of the ministry and taking on more responsibility. All along the way, I look back on it now and say that it was really unhealthy what I was doing. Kids were coming to Christ and praised God for that fruit. But in my own heart, I recognized there was so much striving and trying to push people because of what I wanted to see happening. And... I, in 2015, uh, since I've shared here, then I eventually became a state director in North Dakota, and then in 2015, um, answered the holy divine call of Moses Estevez and became a, became a district director. And uh, um, He came down from the hill. He gave yes, one of the yes. Yeah, the back side of one of the tablets actually said I was supposed to do that. It was yeah, really kind of strange. No. But um, anyway... Um, and my attitude and my approach to ministry hadn't changed yet. And it caught up with me. Mm. And I remember in the summer of 2015, all of a sudden I was just feeling frustrated with people in the ministry that didn't have the same urgency or the same drive that I had. And it was getting so unhealthy. I was getting so frustrated. I even called Reese Coffin and said, Reese, what do I do? As the president of Child Evangelism. Yeah, yeah I, I, I just like, what, 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 what happens? I mean, what do you do when people aren't right where you think they should be? And Reese <laughs> saw right through that, and he said, well, the problem's not really them, Todd. It's you. And, and I'm like, oh, this guy doesn't get me. <laughs> yeah. he, he can't be right. He doesn't know, he doesn't, he doesn't know how this ministry stuff yeah. works. Reese Hoffman doesn't get ministry. <laughs> stuff, so. Don't, don't put, show him the tape of this. But anyway, um, and while we were at our camp program that summer, uh, at the end of the first week, it was getting worse and worse for me, where I was waking up in the morning with a tight chest and shortness of breath. And I, one morning, I thought I was having a heart attack. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I work out a lot. I eat really healthy. What's going on? I, I, that can't be happening. And while at camp, I basically had a breakdown in front of all the staff. And I had an ang- it, an anxiety attack and my basically my body just shut down and it was to the point where I could not go to Walmart 
because the crowd was too big there. And if anybody who knows me knows that I, I love the crowds, I love being in front of people, but I was overwhelmed. And Moses and my state board and my pastor and my wife, they all worked together and they put me on an emergency sabbatical for three months. And I got connected with a Christian counselor who became my sabbatical coach. And there was the beginning of hitting the reset button for me in my life. And what's amazing is over the next three months of just, you know, this Christian counselor and I went right to the word. And right away I knew this is what I needed. Um, Because I had spent too many times being a Christian serving in ministry instead of being a Christian leader. And there's a difference. You could be serving in ministry and be a Christian, but to be a Christian leader meant... It had to be about Christ. Everything I was doing had to be about Christ. And I I had spent so many years being in a marriage as a Christian rather than leading a Christian marriage. And I'd spent too much time in my relationships with people where it was just relationships between two people who happened to be believers rather than being Christian relationships. And what really really I had to learn was the Galatians 2.20 principle. In in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And to approach every relationship, every situation, with that at the forefront of my mind was going to be a big shift for me. You know, I had... I mean, Romans 12, 2, Romans 12, 1 and 2 is often memorized by young kids. You got Awana here, right? Yeah, approved workmen are not ashamed, okay? That's where I first memorized Romans 12, 1 and 2 is when I was a kid in Awana. And I spent my entire life thinking that Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. I spent my entire life thinking that that is what happened upon conversion. When I first come to Christ, I get my mind transformed and renewed. And I didn't realize, no, that happens on a daily basis. That renewal, where I am no longer projecting my old self into life. Instead, I'm surrendering and saying, Christ, you died for this day. You died for this friendship I have with Pastor Mark. You died for this relationship I have with, my, with, with Kim, my wife. And, and, and you died for this relationship I have with staff members, committee members, kids. You die for this, and you live in me. And so I want you to be the Lord of this moment. Help me to project you. And that is, is such a powerful change uh, that can happen in our lives when we are willing to do that. For me personally, it, it changed everything. It changed me from where I was no longer trying to figure, uh, figure out what I could get out of people And no longer feel that I was responsible for them, but instead, I was responsible to them. I was responsible to my wife, to be to be Christ to her, as Scripture shows that I'm to be, to to represent and project Christ to her, and and to the staff and everybody. And so, I just praise God for that journey, uh, being able to hit the reset button and, and to learn. And it's just yeah, there's been so much joy in the journey. Uh, obviously, there's still times when I have to stop and say, wait a minute, I'm projecting the old self, and it's really ugly. But, so. I, you had said something the other day that kind of was one of those moments for me when we were talking. You said that at a certain point, after this had all transpired, you're going through the counseling, you're getting, <laughs> your wife says you, holy, you responded in a certain way, and her response was like, it almost shocked you, like, why are you bringing this up? Do you don't remember what I'm yep, talking yep. about? What, 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 tell us about that a little bit. Um, my sabbatical coach told me, he said, as you grow in this understanding and practice of, of projecting Christ, the, the new self we see in Scripture, as you grow in this, your wife will be the first to notice. And she's going to fall in love with you all over again. And we were, Kim had arranged for us to go off to a camp in Wisconsin for three weeks as a family for part of my sabbatical. And it was a, just a great time for me of just quiet study at this camp. And, and she was with the kids uh, for the mornings. And, and one evening at the camp, 
she just she just said that very thing. She's like, huh, you responded this way tonight to this. And I'm like, is that bad? <laughs> She's like, no, that's not bad. It's really good. And I said, well, you know, Cole told me that you'd be the first to notice a change. And he said you would also fall in love with me all over again. And she said, he's absolutely right. So... Isn't that awesome? It That's is. So, Absolutely so awesome. amazing. Well, I'm, I'm sensing that there's probably some people sitting here that are going, thinking to themselves, well, it's nice that you work for this ministry, that you can take three months off and do that. I don't have that. Yeah. Um, but they want to experience something like that. Um, how can we help them? How can we pray for them? How, what, what can we do about that? Oh, boy. Um, I would say going back to those Galatians 2.20, start there. You know, people, even when we are told in Scripture to meditate on the, on the, on the Word, uh, don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth, meditate on it day and night. Um, and and we, we, we throw that word out because we think meditation is burning incense and like humming and weird things like that. But when, when we're, if we're honest with each other, we all meditate, every single one of us, because every one of us has worried at some point, Right? Well, worry is meditation. It's taking a fear and it's putting it at the forefront of your mind and letting that fear drive your entire being. And the result is worry. And so I think that just starting with that principle of Galatians 2.20, Romans 12, 1 and 2, um, and, and just starting there and saying, okay, Lord, this is true. Yes, I have been crucified. And I, I, I want, even if this means like praying something along the lines of what of that verse says, half a dozen times a day to really get ourselves to focus and, and approach every single situation, every thought, feeling, and action, um, is surrendering them and allowing the old self to shrink and the new self to grow, the, who we are in Christ. Um, I would say just getting into that mindset um, and also looking at just our relationships there, by default, we are going to be codependent in our relationships. We're always looking for what we can get out of people. Um, that's just natural, t- uh, sinful nature, tendencies for us. Um, and looking at every single one of those relationships and saying, how can we project Christ to others in that? Um, as far as like the magic formula, how do you do it if you don't get a sabbatical? Uh, God forbid you have to have a breakdown in order to get a sabbatical or something like that. Instead, I, I think setting that time, that reset time on a weekly basis, you know, the Sabbath, I mean, we, we, oh, we're all guilty of that. We don't take the time on a weekly basis to reset yeah. and take a step back yeah. and, and to really um, kind of take stock. I got a dear mentor who just challenges me. He said it. You know, you have to take some time every single week and take time every single month uh, to recalibrate your, your, your compass and your clock, he says, uh, to really see what's guiding you and see what the calendar says and where you're going with that. Yeah. I think that's important, too. But yeah, I wish I had the perfect you right. know, here. You know, well, I th- here's the I, formula. And I think part of that is just you asking the Lord, saying, I am hearing what he's saying, God. Could you play that out for me before I would get to this level? Yeah. And he's amazing how he will answer that. Now, now he may not answer it the way we'd want him to answer it, but yeah. um, it would be the best thing. And what a loving father that he would do that. Yeah. He's, any of us that have children that love our children, if our kid came and asked us for something and it was a good thing, it was something that we would look at and go, that's a good thing, we would do whatever we could to yeah. get them. Well, he's God. Yeah. So he can. Yeah. Would you pray for all of us, but pray specifically for people that this is really resonating with them right now. Yeah. They're, they're, um, they're wanting that. Would you pray for them? Right now? Absolutely. Sure. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you that you are not some distant God who doesn't pay attention, but we just, Lord, we thank you for your love, your care for us, for the privilege of being called your children. We thank you for giving us your spirit that you may shape us to look more and more like Christ. 
Lord, I just pray for, for wisdom for each one of us to truly understand. We beg of you, God, because we lack it. You promise us if anyone lacks wisdom, we should ask because you so freely give. And Lord, we beg of you for the wisdom and the discernment to know how, how, how does this work for us? When we're caught up in, in, in striving, when we're caught up in, in trying to just accomplish things, we're caught up in just bringing sacrifice after sacrifice to you, Lord. Uh, we know your word says it's not what you want. You want the obedient heart. You want that relationship. You want us to, to grow closer and, 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 and hunger more and more for you. And Lord, for each one of us, Lord, make it clear what that looks like. Thank you for all that you've given us, all that you've promised us, and how you walk with us doesn't make sense, Lord. We can't grasp this. Thank you for who you are, who you've called us to be. Please bless this church, oh Lord, the ministries, the outreach that are happening from this place, the growth that's happening in the hearts of, the, of this body. Bless Pastor Mark and the leaders here, Lord. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for how you bring them all together but all for your glory, Lord. May none of this at all, not one iota of this, be about us, be about church, be about whatever ministry we were involved in. May it not be about that, but may it all be about you and for your glory. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, don't leave yet. Uh, we were talking because I'm going to be doing that Sunday school class, and you were asking me about millennials, understanding millennials. Yes. And and things along. You said to me, the first thing that came out of your mouth is, I love millennials. Yeah. Well, we have a young man that's going to be reading scripture, Joseph Rukavina. Yes. Is that his name? And uh, tell us a little bit about Joseph. He's at Children's Ministry Institute right now, and he's going to come on up. Come on up, Joe. And, uh, but I put you on the spot there. But Oh, yeah. Let me tell you about this guy. Um, I mean, it just, uh, you know, you, when he reads a scripture, he's so spiritual and holy, <laughs> you'll hear angels. It's just beautiful. Yeah. No, this young man, uh, back in 2012, I met Joseph and uh, was part of Good News Across America in the Twin Cities. And he's from the Twin Cities. And he just graduated from Moody Bible Institute in December and is finishing up Children's Ministries Institute uh, soon and is taking on being a local director for the Twin Cities chapter in Minnesota, which is part of my district. And I'm so thrilled to have Joseph on our team. Uh, just a great, great leader. God has blessed him with insight. I got together with him in September uh, with a pastor friend of mine in the Twin Cities, and we sat down and just kind of wanted to hear his heart for what he wants to see happen in the Twin Cities for the ministry there. And at the end of it, I called my buddy that we met with, with whom, you know, we met. And I said, what do you think of this young guy? And he said, you got a thoroughbred there. You got a young man who's ready to lead. And so I praise God for Joseph. I praise God for his heart. Uh, and he's extremely gifted, uh, which can be really good or really bad. Uh, and so I, I'm very excited to see what God does in and through him. So... Um, if you if you don't feel God's touch from His Scripture reading, no, just kidding. But uh, yeah, very excited. So pray for this great great young leader as he comes to work for us in the, uh, in Minnesota. And um, yeah, very thankful for him. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Go ahead, Joseph. So no pressure on this reading. <laughs> All right. um, this is Mark four one through twenty. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into the boat and sat on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed. Some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell along the rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since there was no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds 
fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on the rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And then they have no root in themselves, but endure for a little while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises, on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown in good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Thank you, Todd, and thank you, Joseph. Appreciate it. Well, now that Scripture has been read, your Bible is open there, and we're going to look at this context here as as uh, something that I believe is really important. Um, obviously, all of the Bible is important, um, but there are times when certain stories and certain uh, contexts are looked at, uh, and you'll see why this one is crucial to understanding some other things that Jesus will teach. You do remember when we were first starting talking about the book of Mark that it is a, um, a book on the go. Uh, when I think about a lot of the, the, what is going on in our culture today, people get bored pretty quickly. They're, they're finding that as time goes by, more and more, the attention span is dropping more and more. And uh, it's, it's our fault. I mean, we, what's being thrown out there and what is given to our kids and our kids kids it's just how it how it plays out and so mark plays out well for this generation because things are done immediately straightforward he's moving and i like that i don't know if you were ever caught behind somebody in a store or behind somebody in a lane of traffic and you want to get moving the other day i pulled out and the guy next door pulled out and he just is and i and i was like but I didn't want to be that guy on 47 that's passing people and, and making life interesting for everybody else or myself because stuff comes quickly. Um, and so Jesus uh, or God in his wisdom goes, I'm going to give you a gospel. Those of you that are like that, I'm going to give you one and I'm going to call it Mark. All right. That's what we're going to do. But this context, this chapter is one of the most extensive chapters of teaching. It's almost like, okay, I know you're in a hurry, but we're going to stop right now. We're going to slow down. I want you to think about this, and it's a crucial thing. And so this part in Rome, uh, Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 13 are the, is the most extensive amount of training in the gospel of Mark. The rest of the time, he's moving. He's moving from story to story. Even after we get from this context to the next one, it is going to be he's going right into uh, other stories. And so he's causing us to slow down and think about this. And he's saying, I want you to have an understanding of this thing called evangelism. Which is crucial. I mean, look at the calling on our lives, the Great Commission. Mark chapter uh, 20, I mean, Matthew chapter 28, 
verses 19 and 20. This is for all of us. It's called the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is for every one of us. Every one of us, at some point in our lives, uh, as we're interacting with people, we've got to do this thing called evangelism. So let me just throw that out there. Is that on your heart ever? Is that something that you're thinking about? I know we've even got this ministry that we just talked about a little bit, Child Evangelism Fellowship, which is thinking about um, constantly, how can I reach children? Well, that might not be your calling, that specific niche. I would think that at some point you'd have an interest if you have kids, grandkids, you have nieces and nephews and stuff, that would be on your heart, or just people. But there's also just all different spots for evangelism. How are you doing that in your life as a Christian? Because that's, we as Christians are, are called that. And so God in his wisdom says, I need for you to have an understanding of what that looks like. And Jesus uses a picture, a parabola. Parabola meaning a story thrown alongside. I'm using an analogy. I'm using an allegory. I'm using a metaphor. I'm using a figure of speech. I want you to have an understanding of what that looks like. I was listening to John MacArthur talk about teachers, and when he looks at teaching and people will say to him, how do you know when somebody is good at teaching? How do you know if somebody has that kind of heart? He said, and he's got a lot of different ideas, but the thing that he keeps coming back to is this. If a person can look at or hear uh, a concept, a story, or have things in his life that he's coming in contact with, and he sees that in that story or that incident or that event a way to communicate truth using that, he goes, that to him is a person that will be good at teaching. They don't have to have a bunch of books in their library that has a Bible illustrations, or as a pastor, he has to run over to that bookshelf, and I, I need a story here that regularly through his life, he sees stuff happening, and he goes, oh, this would be a great way to teach this truth, or I, they just, they use that picture, and the best model of that was Jesus, the master storyteller, and so look at where we're at here, point number one, if you want to take notes, take that out of your, there's a section here in both, and take that out, and you can write some things in. Point number one, listen to the man, listen to the man. Look at verse one again, again, <laughs> he says, again, he began to teach, okay? So this is a pattern in Jesus' life, the master teacher. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, so he'd done that before, and a very large crowd gathered about him. So that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. So get the picture. Some of you experienced spring break, okay? Some of you are like, I wish I could have experienced spring break, okay? But if you could imagine the beach, and you look out onto the water, and there's, the crowd has gotten so big that they're crowding Jesus so much so that he, he knows he's smart, God, all right? How, what would be the best way to communicate? Guys, fishermen, guys, get me a boat. I'm going to get in that boat. We're going to get out into the water, and somehow there's going to be a set, set way to have almost like this amphitheater effect where he's in the water, in, in the boat in the water, sitting there teaching them, speaking in such a way that they can all hear. So this loud, this I envision, man, I don't know how they could hear, but Jesus is really smart. You could say, well, miraculously, he could up the ampage of his speaker abilities, okay? Um, I'm thinking that he knew what he was doing. He knew it worked. And so he gets, and he starts to teach, and he's, and he's, and he's, he's doing this so much so in a way that he has to teach them something that is going to be very, very important and i think we need to hear it um and it has had to be frustrating for the religious leaders at that time because they probably put a, invested a lot in their synagogues and how things looked and their flowing robes and and just their their um liturgy and how they went about things and we've got this man who follows his cousin who actually preached in the wilderness john the baptist and he was wearing 
weird clothes and he was had a weird diet and he just set people straight and people would just by the masses go out well now people are going out to see jesus and he's he's sitting in a boat and he's talking and they're showing up what's up with that and it's just further in uh further proof to me that god can do whatever he wants and however he wants and he, he can use you and i in the different aspects and and different places so for you to be open to that 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 even as we prayed or as todd prayed for you about um some of you may be having to step back some of you maybe need to step up in the power of christ it's time to do just that 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 you your relationship with him is good and 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 there isn't those things that he was talking about and and it's time and but where is your boat in the water Where's your place? It doesn't have to be to a crowd, but where's your place that, that God could use you? Well, let's listen to the message here. Listen to the message, point number two. This word teach is the, some form of didactic, systematic instruction, and his style moves away from uh, the plain teaching to a parabolic teaching. Look at this, verse two. And he was teaching them many things in parables, alongside, thrown alongside, And in his teaching, he said to them, look at this, listen, and Jesus says this every now and then, he says, listen, I don't know if you've ever heard Charles Stanley preach. If you ever listen to Charles Stanley preach, that that old preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, my man says, listen, all the time. Like, it almost would get to the point where, I don't know if you had a teacher that had a quirk, (laughs) if you ever have a teacher that had a quirk, where you'd start to count, like you'd almost have bets before class, He's going to do this, you know, and you, you know, and at the end of class, 25, who got close, you know, in the pool, you know, and you give, hand out cash. I know you guys never did that, but you're, you've got a sick, sick pastor. Um, but Charles Stanley, you'd make a lot of money. You'd, you'd be like, if you were saying how much, how many times he says, listen. Well, Jesus didn't say listen a lot. When it comes to the scriptures, he'd say, verily, verily, he'd say certain things. But when he says, listen, I would think that you would go, I ought to listen. This is important. So he said, look at this. He says, listen, a sower went out to sow. And so he, he uses an illustration that they would get right away. He, he's talking agrarian. He's talking agriculture. And they would get this. It would be... Uh, like us in this town talking about St. Louis Cardinal baseball. It would be um, the Blues. It would be um, Chuck Berry. It would be, um, and you could, all the different things that are Emo's Pizza. I know, some of you are like, I know, it's not the square beyond compare with some of you, all right? But Jesus knew what would work with his community. And, and so he says that, and he says that this job, this, this sower, this thing is going to have ramifications for, and he'll list four different types of response to it. Now, people call this the parable of the sower, but actually the sower is only mentioned few times compared to the seed or compared actually to the soils. And so it, nothing is mentioned here about what the sower wears. Not, nothing is mentioned about the sower's technique, uh, which a lot of times, if we're not careful, we can start to think about those things concerning how people do evangelism or how people do church. He's saying, Jesus is saying, and he's really smart, and he's saying, listen, The same thing is going to be sent out to all these different types of soils. And the response is going to be these ways. And so when you and I are thinking about how we do evangelism and how we do church and how we're interacting with people that we love and and we're wanting to be used in a powerful way in people's lives, understand that these are the responses of people so that you don't get frustrated. Because it will be very easy to get frustrated. Um, We saw him giving testimony of that, and he had to bring back to uh, what does the Scripture say about things. Well, look at verse 4 here. And as he sowed, 
Some, fe- some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. And so uh, the idea of a broadcast isn't a radio term primarily, even though we've used uh, that got hijacked by the radio people or by TV people. There's this broadcast. But actually, the term broadcast is an agricultural term. And what would happen is there would be a sower that would have a bag of seed that he would reach into that bag and he'd broadcast, he'd cast it out in a broad way. Same seed thrown out. But there's this, there's different kinds of soil. And and so we see here this first soil. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. And so in between the rows of seed, now, now we, we're so mechanized and we're so technological, we go, well, that's dumb. Why don't they just, you know, do... I remember as a kid learning about the story of the pilgrims and the Indians and you heard about the seed being laid in there and then they took fish and, you know, and some call it corn, we call it maize, you know, and, and, these, and these things come up and, and we all, oh, this is so wise. Why, why would he... That's how they did it. And so he's just using their thing. And so on, there's a path that he's on, and he's throwing seed, and birds are flying around. That's why they have scarecrows. Birds are flying around, and this guy keeps walking, and they see seed on the path that has been hardened by people walking on it. The seed lands on that, and the bird sees that, and dives down, and it's got its food. Next one, there's five and six. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depths of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. And so there were others that when it was thrown, and, and Israel was packed with rocks. I mean, that's why, of all things, they picked for capital punishment, they picked stoning. All right, I know, I mean, how do we kill people? We got a lot of rocks here, Joe, you know. Uh, but what would happen is, it wasn't just rocks, because a farmer would go through and he'd, he'd get that out of the way. Like you, if you're going mowing, you'd send your kid out. I know some, I've heard of parents and they'd get the tr- twigs and all stuff. But they would get those rocks out. It wasn't necessarily talking about that. It was talking about a limestone layer and that the dirt above that was, oh, only that. And so that seed would land in, in a place that it could grow, but the, 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 there was no root to it, and so it would grow up quickly. But then when the sun came, it would scorch it and it would die. Verse 7, next group. Other seed fell along among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. So others were thrown, and you know, it's not hard to grow weeds. Just let... Let it go. Like, have you ever heard, I've heard about the guy who works in his garden and people come in and they, oh, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it great what God has done? And the gardener just looks at him like, um, no, I've seen what God does. Yeah, we understand what he's saying, but gardening's work. It's not weeding. I don't know, weeding for you was a joy. It wasn't, you know, my mom sent us out. And when you weed, you can't just yank them. You had to go deep. Get it for the roots and all. So it isn't hard. So we see this. It makes sense. And so the thorns and the weeds, and they, they choke, choke the seed, and, and it isn't going to be of any value to grow. And then, and then the last one. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And by the way, these numbers are off the charts. In Palestine... They say statistically, if the best you could do is 7.5 fold, the best. And so when Jesus is saying this, he's got their ears. What? 30? What? So he's, he's saying, though, if the seed lands and if it hits the spot, it's going to be amazing. So let me get this straight. Birds, rocks, thorns, or good. 
Ajá. And then he says this at the end of that. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so what he's saying is you and I could sit in church or hear religious talks or hear Jesus say it. And there would still be people that would go, uh, and they just get distracted. They'll forget what I'm saying right now will mean only so much to you. He's he's basically saying, are you willing to be to call out to God, say, I want to be part of the 25 percent. I want I want God. God, I don't know what kind of soil my life is, where my heart is right now. I, I want that. He's saying that there's a bunch of people that get the seed, but only a certain percentage, it really registers with them. That's why there'll be times where you'll be sitting next to somebody and you'll be so fired up about what, and you'll look over and they're like, huh? Eh, it's doing nothing for them. Last point, point three. Listen to the meaning. Listen to the meaning. Verse 10. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And so those even truly close to Jesus want to understand him. It's not just because there are people that are following him. Here's why a lot of them are following him. They love that he can do miracles. They like a free meal. They like to see their cousin healed. And, but, he, but a big part for him is teaching. And so these are taking it so seriously. I've told you before about our basketball ministry and how I share with them like five minutes. Here's what many of them are thinking while I'm sharing. I know it. When is he going to shut up so that we can play basketball? I could say, no, no, I'm really amazing. They'd rather play basketball, a lot of them. Every now and then, every now and then, I'll be talking, and there's a young person I'm looking, and God's doing something I can just tell. But the mass, the vast majority of them, rocky, birds, there's a battle going on. Now, if you've ever had that when you're, share, you're starting to share the gospel, the other, just this week I share, was sharing the gospel with somebody. And we talked about his life. We talk, we're in McDonald's. We're talk, we, we went for like an hour and 45 minutes talking about different things. And at a certain point I said, I, I just want to share something with you. Could I? And we started talking about eternal matters. No lie, and we're at McDonald's and everybody is walking by. Nothing's happening. Now I'm starting to talk about things of God. No lie. People coming out of the woodwork. I had one guy come over, and it's nice, and you don't want to go, shut up, this is amazing what I'm sharing. Because they would go, what? So I'm praying that I just rest in the Lord. It's his business anyways, but somebody comes up. And then, no lie, he's sitting there with coffee the whole time. Finally, we start talking beyond that guy. That guy leaves, now would you like some coffee? How often do they do this at McDonald's? <laughs> Honestly. Well, here's why. We're getting somewhere. We're talking eternal matters. We are in a battle. The, Jesus said this would happen. So don't be shocked when it happens. Look at this. Verse, actually 11, I want to uh, highlight this for a moment. Verse 11, and he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. So those of you that are having ears to hear and listen, you're, you're starting to resonate with God. To you have been given secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Now that's a hard verse. You don't, don't just pass it. Cause everybody's got, some people got this idea about Jesus. He's just puppy dogs and rainbows. And he's just like, ah. there's times parables were given for this revelation and for judgment. So the thing that you would think, man, 
man, you would think people would resonate with this. Jesus is going, I purposely say it this way because I don't want them to get it. Well, that doesn't sound like that's what Jesus said. And so here's my prayer. God, I want to be soil that is so tender toward you. Because I could, in, I could be missing a lot of what God wants to communicate because my heart, my heart is so hard. And there's a battle going on. Look at verse um, 13. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So he's saying this. If you don't get this one, you're not going to understand the rest. Do you get that? There are certain things when it comes to certain, like some of you do math or construction, or th- and there are certain things that are like foundational. I would think for geometry, the Pythagorean theorem would be like a pretty big deal. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And if you don't get that one, you're going to struggle with a bunch of geometry. He's saying, I'm going to talk in parables a lot. If you don't get this one, you might as well forget about the other ones. This is huge. Look at verse um, 15. The sower so, or 14. The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear it, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. So we're in, a, we're in a spiritual battle. When you sit down and you go, I want my family to know about God. I want my friends to know about God. No, you're in a battle. Understand there's warfare going on. That like a bird, whatever, he's going around. He's, he's waiting for an opportunity. Hard heart, I'm going to steal. I'm going to take. So understand that. Almost, uh, it got to the point, literally, when, that was go- when I was sharing with my friend and, and it was got like that, I almost wanted to laugh, but it would look stupid, all right? So they're like, he's trying, but I'm going to keep going. Look at verse 16 and 17. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, immediately they fall away. You ever have that where you meet somebody and they get saved at somebody and they're so happy and you go, they must have been saved. Look at their happiness. Look at their joy. Jesus is saying that isn't necessarily a sign that they got saved. Isn't that interesting? Because a lot of times we go, so what happened at that meeting? Well, I think they got saved. Why? They're so happy. Part of their happiness may be they finally had somebody they can kind of unload some of their junk on. And they could talk about it. And they feel a little bit better. But when the hard times come, so, sometimes, this, is gonna, this, this may not even sound biblical to some of you, but I'm just telling you it's Bible. Sometimes the best response to somebody gets saved is actually they're sad. Blessed are they that mourn. Because they're like, they've come to, to grips with, man, I... I'm like a sinner. Like I needed, I needed Jesus. And joy comes in the morning. Joy comes later. Joy comes through the persecution. That when you start seeing over the long haul some changes, you're like, that person saved. Because the fruit of what's coming out of their life. Verse 18. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Wow. Luke 8, Luke 8, verse 14. This is the others. This is Luke talking about. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. And that may be some of us here today. That may be you today. You're wondering, why am I not growing deep? It's because our hearts are worship factories. We just, we just look to worship. And you're caught up in a bunch of stuff, and you're wondering, why isn't God what he needs to be? Because you are so 
your desires are so in tune with not what he wants. And to get to the point where you go, God, I want you, and then you change the desires of my heart. And those, some of those things aren't even necessarily bad things, but they're pushing away what God wants. Because when he is in the proper place, those, we can even have those things, and we've got a different view of them. Last one. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. So this is the parable of the soils. And the soil is our heart. We either have a hard heart or an impulsive or emotional heart or a preoccupied heart, or a well-prepared heart. What kind of heart is yours this morning? Where does God find you today? 